So now I'm going to tell you how this works in the real world. Um, as Vinny said, President of Mind Readers in the U.S., a commercial company with headquarters here in Dublin, Ireland, also offices in London, uh, South Africa, and Australia. So the thing about our industry is it enables business. So that tire store down there, they can't be in business unless our industry delivers the goods. Now, sure, the, the guy working behind the counter at the tire store doesn't have to be as highly trained and educated as potentially a nuclear engineer, but it still has to happen. So we enable business. None of this happens without our industry. But what's so exciting about the center is it provides growth. It's a well-known fact that business growth comes from new ideas, right? But a new idea, a good idea, unactualized, doesn't do anybody any good. Now, if you went out, I suppose, and asked 100 CEOs, would you like to be investing more money in innovation than you are? I'm guessing 99 are gonna say yes. The one that says no is probably a former CFO. And that's because the CFOs will look at the spreadsheets and say, well, wait a minute, you've got these five projects, new research and development, and only two of them succeed. Right? And so he just says, well, don't spend any of that money at all. The nice thing about this center is it eases that pain. If you are considering engaging with the, the Center for Learning Innovation, it can ease your pain. I'll use an example. Johnny and I were over at the University of Galway. This is about four years ago now. And we were looking at some of the prototypes that the grad students were working on. And I remember the first one I saw, I was blown away. I said, this is absolute rubbish. And, uh, and, and the kid, <laughs> and the young man that uh, was showing me the demo was a bit crestfallen when I said that. And of course, Americans are known for being politically incorrect, so I kind of take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, it was being quite blunt. And he said, well, you're, you're right, it kind of it doesn't work. But that led to this other thing. And he showed us another demo. And that one was absolutely brilliant. So what I was able to do is I go back to the office. We have a development office here in Dublin and one over in America. And I could sit down with the guys there, pull out the best prototypes, and say, OK, there are 10 ways to do this. They did nine of them that didn't work. And this is the one that works. So when you engage with the Competence Center, don't set your expectations, in my opinion, at we're going to get source code that we can sell right away. You'll get the best practices, you'll get ideas of what will work and what won't work, and that again just eases your pain. So now Linda's going to come up here and she's going to talk about a prototype that, that she and the team have been working on that is currently in a trial uh, with the Spirit Group, a heart, large hospitality pubs and restaurants uh, in the UK. So over to Linda. Okay, I'm going to talk about, um, first of all, the corporate challenges that were presented to us. Um, we were asked to speed up onboarding and improve career progression, reduce time to competency and improve performance, capture tacit knowledge being lost from organizations, improve the 360 degree review process to identify and retain key staff, improve critical thinking and problem solving skills, Reduce attrition rates by improving staff engagement. What an ask. So essentially, these challenges were presented to us. Now, now these were one of three sets of challenges, one in the corporate sector, one in K-12, and one in higher ed. So we had a group of technologies, um, a toolkit of technologies that we were working with. We had social search, semantic search, personalization and composition, data analytics for informal learning, and reflection technology. These were technologies of our academic partners. So we had to decide what combinations of these technologies would we use to address the challenges in each of the three sectors. So essentially, corporate had their own challenges, K-12 and higher ed. So we went off, we considered it, we came up with combinations of technologies, we put them together, and we delivered three demonstrators. Now, it's important to say that our solutions for each of, the, uh, each of these three sets of challenges are demonstrators. 
they're not products that are ready for market. We're demonstrating the potential of these technologies. And again, each demonstrator is a set of technologies. So it's not about just using them all. The idea would be our industry partners could pick and mix what technologies they wanted to address specific challenges within their organizations. Um, I'm going to start with corporate, then go through K-12 and higher ed. I'm not going to go through them in as much detail as I would like to, because we don't have time. But at the end, um, our team will, will be there. They will have the demonstrators up and running, and you can have a look at them. So in each of the three demonstrators, the process for developing them was the same. We started off with the, with the challenges, and then our industry partners, this is all industry driven. They identified those challenges for us. They presented us with those challenges. We then created a use case around those challenges. So we had three use cases. It's grounded in the real world um, so that we can take it out and evaluate it with end users in each of the sectors. So we designed the demonstrator, developed the demonstrator, then went to trial for end user trials with two of them, K-12 and higher ed. With corporate, we're going to end user trial in September. But in the interim, we had an industry focus group evaluate it. And then finally, we created an evaluation report. All of this was done in one year, which is, is amazing. I mean, I, I've been in academia, I've been in industry, and this is, you know, this is a real achievement. Okay, in corporate, our industry partners were interactive services and mind leaders. They presented us with A, the challenges, and B, content to populate our system with. Um, the percolate solution for the corporate sector. Okay, how do we describe this? It's a, it's a, um, a corporate portal that provides point of need, personalized, informal, and formal learning. We took all of our technologies in this case because the challenges were so many and so varied, so we used all of them. And um, we deployed them in a, a social and collaborative learning environment to address the industry challenges that were uh, presented to us. Now, if you have a look at the, um, at the top left-hand side, you will see that there's a support network there. The function of the support network is to speed up and facilitate onboarding within organizations. High attrition rates at the onboarding stage uh, occurs because lack of connectedness um, with new starts. They don't feel part of the organization, so they leave after they've had extensive training. The idea here is that um, the, each new start will be assigned a manager, experienced peer, newly onboarded peer, and somebody on the next rung of the corporate ladder. The purpose of that is to mentor them and to um, to encourage them to contribute as well to informal learning. So you have career progression going on there. So the role of the support network is that they would do, carry out the appraisals of the new start, but they would also encourage them to contribute to informal learning. There has to be a culture of informal learning in the organization. It has to come from the top down. It won't work any other way. So if you want to tap into tacit knowledge, you need to be driving this through managers ex explaining the importance and also technology to harness this. Um, in the center here, I just want to see if my, oh yeah, in the center here, um, so for example, <clears throat> if we go back to the challenge, how do you uh, speed up time to competency and how do you improve performance? Well, critical to that is for employees to be able to access point of need learning that's tailored to their role within the organization to provide it when they need it. So what we have, oh, excuse me, I need to put that up. So essentially what we have is a search box at the top. So if an employee has a point of need, um, information need or learning need, they type their query in there. The search system searches over not just formal learning, which they get here, but also informal learning repositories. So all learning repositories within the organization. So up here we have the LMS. It's searching over the LMS. 
and it's composing a personalized learning episode. Here is circular with a wiki and communities with classes and any other informal learning repository. So OneSearch is trawling through the learning repository, both formal, informal, returning role relevant material to the employee at their point of need. So again, that's to improve performance and speed up time to competency. What's in action here is the personalization um, is in action up here in the formal learning area. It's trawling over the LMS. I'll explain how it happens in a minute. And here we have the social and semantic search searching over the informal learning area. So in terms of the, um, the personalization, um, what's happening here is the key innovation here is that what's returned to the user here is personalized and tailored to their needs. MindEaters provided us with 67 courses. We disaggregated those courses into 402 topics and we meta tagged them according to competencies. So competencies within an organization. So they were generic competencies. So again, we took their courses, we disaggregated them, we meta tagged them. And what happens then is when a user does a search, um, the, the, relevant, the relevant topics are pulled out, then they're recomposed and person, personalized into a learning episode that's tailored to the search query of that particular person within the organization. So they're not just getting a one-size-fits-all list of formal content. They're getting a personalized learning episode, a short learning episode targeted to the learning needs. So if we move on, uh, so what is the benefit of this to an organization? Well, it increases the potential use of content. And that's very valuable to any organization who, who may have a lot of training content in their LMS. So we had 67 courses, 42 topics, the four, the, or sorry, 402 topics. The 402 topics were tagged to 45 competencies. So an amazing opportunity for reuse of content. Um, okay, so in terms of enhanced search, what's the key innovation here? We combined social and semantic search. The social and semantic search are trawling through the informal learning areas within an organization and they're returning context, or, or content that is not only uh, context relevant, but it's highly rated. So the key here is, so it's, it could be context relevant, but it may not be all that useful to people who find it. So what's happening so is the combination of the context relevance and the semantic search that is the, it's highly rated by a community of peers. So again, everybody is buying into this idea of the informal learning. So the employees are rating content in relation to how useful they actually find it. Um, so another key innovation, uh, the informal learning data analytics. Uh, there's formal learning data analytics all over the place, but there's nothing out there to tap into informal learning. So with informal learning, it's, you have to look at not just the level of contributions, but what is the value of those contributions. When somebody finds it, how useful is it to them? So we're looking at the quantitative data on it, the <coughs> qualitative data on it as well. So if we go back to the manager I spoke about in the support network, and he's responsible for new start, he can go into the management tab here. He can click there and he can see what the new start are contributing in terms of informal learning. So what wiki articles are they, are, are they adding? How are they posting in the communities of practice? What is the value in the, of those posts? So how highly rated are they by the community of peers? Um, so that's of, useful, uh, of use to the manager for the 360 degree appraisal. In, at London, uh, or in London in January at the Learning Technologies um, Exhibition, um, talent management companies were talking about the fact that uh, they talk about 360 degree appraisal, but they can't get the full view. They can't get analytics around what somebody is contributing informally to organisations. And sometimes they're letting the wrong people go. 
um, there's also an employee view. So an employee can see what they're contributing. It happens in real time. So if they make a reflection, rate a wiki article, add a wiki article, post in the community as a practice, they can see it happening in real time. And this motivates and engages them and makes them feel as though they're part of a community. Um, okay, in terms of our reflection technology here, reflection has been designated a core 21st century skill. So it's about when you experience something in the workplace, that you reflect upon it and you learn from it. What this technology does, it, it itself isn't doing the reflection, it's enabling reflection to take place. So it's scaffolding the user, it's prompting them to think about what they learned from specific experiences. It could be a task they completed very efficiently and they want to get out there to other people. It could be a collaboration they had with somebody and they want to learn from it. And what the technology does as well is it captures these reflections. So they're available for the, for the employees to see at a later date and also maybe to bring to their appraisals as evidence of having learned on the job. Again, these are all different technologies. We've brought them together to address the challenges that were presented to us. Um, we didn't get this to use your trial because of, of business pressures um, within that particular sector. We are going in September. In the interim, we had a focus group. Um, they, were, they consisted of our partners and other people as well, and also uh, clients of our partners. Um, so one of the questions was, do you think your customers would like or are ready for the overall non-corporate solution? And um, overwhelmingly, they're moving in that direction or yes. So there is a movement towards this. On the face of it, it looks like it's disruptive technology because they're, they're impinging onto talent management, they're going into the LMS technologies and so on. But at the same time, this is what it's moving towards and we need to be aware of that. Um, which component of the system do you think your customers will be most interested in? The majority said personalization. Um, but we believe that they were inextricably linking the social and semantic search and the personalization. Um, but they did see the value in it as we saw with the comments that came through. Participants saw the value in the search returning structured chunks of formal learning personalized to the role of the learner within the organization rather than a list of formal content, which is what happens currently in Wikipedia search. So comments from the industry partners. I like the way the learning episode is presented. I like the way the learning is composed. Um, like the learning composer, we'd love to mix our own content with the formal content in here. That's the client of Mind Eaters. And McDonald's, love the learning composer, but would like more control to customize his interface. And that's fine. That's a customization um, issue. So essentially, we're looking forward to September because there's nothing like getting a demonstrator out there um, and testing it with real end users. Uh, we've had the industry partners' feedback. Um, there are evaluation reports which details it much more than I, I've done here. Okay, so that's the corporate, um, the corporate demonstrator. Oh yeah, some feedback on search. Um, participants saw the value in the combined social and semantic search, searching over multiple content sources. And comments from the clients, I like search, it's not limited to one source of content. Very often, uh, companies have various repositories of content where material sits. But it's difficult to get it all back, particularly um, with one search query. So this enables uh, a company to pull out all their formal and informal learning assets, learning assets and present it to their um, employees. Okay. Moving swiftly on then to the skills demonstrator, because I have a lot to cover. Again, same technologies combined in different ways to meet different industry challenges. We have HMH and Intel here. Again, they gave us our challenges and uh, they, they provided us with the content we used to populate our system. Their challenges were they wanted to leverage open content sources. 
They wanted to identify gaps in industry-generated content that are currently being filtered by open content sources. They wanted to reuse, re-monetize their existing learning content and raise all boats by helping average, fast and struggling learners at the same time. Um, so our use case here revolved around Josh and Amy. Josh and Amy, two math students, uh, algebra students. Uh, Josh is 13 years old. He's demotivated. He struggles with his algebra. Amy is 11. She excels with math. So Josh and Amy's parents want to simultaneously address the different learning needs of both of their, of their kids. So the percolate solution, as, as Vinnie mentioned, um, was a personalised homework help portal. So what technologies have we used in there? Um, we use social search. So when a student enters, they uh, search like linear equations, which is with, from the algebra domain. Um, the social search searches over the publisher content, so that's the formal content, but also the open content, whitelisted open content. So it returns to them both formal content and the open content from the web. You can see the Khan Academy in there. This social search is driven by a rating system. So the community is rating content. Um, the personalization in here is in the form of, of, of a recommender. The recommender computes the ability level of a student based on co-rating of content. So a student is recommended content which students of similar ability have found useful. Other technologies we have in there, so we use gaming techniques. I won't call it gamification because I know that a few people don't like that. But we use gaming techniques to motivate and incentivize students. We have to get them to rate. So how do we incentivize them to rate? So essentially, they can see who is rating here. And they can also, so remember, this is a community of learners, cl a class in this stage. They can see who's rating and do they trust the person who's rating content. So they may follow specific people and take content that they've rated highly uh, as being an indication of the quality of that content. Um, so we also use avatars. So students can select their own avatars. And again, when uh, Neil and I, Neil was the tech lead in this project, when we were out in the field, we saw that students uh, really, really enjoyed the idea that they could select their own avatar. And they can see who else in the community is online. Um, we also have reflection technology in there. This time it's serving a different purpose because we don't know the students at this age if they're capable of reflection. But we do know that students with highly developed metacognitive skills succeed better at school. So what we're trying to do here is to develop their metacognitive skills. We scaffold them. We get them to think about how they're learning and where the problem points are. And we try to help them develop strategies that will improve their learning techniques. Um, so we did go to end user trial here. We had three schools, we had five classes, and it took place over four weeks. Um, we had 91 students aged 12 to 13. Uh, they ranged from special needs to high ability. And that was important because one of our challenges was, was to raise all boats simultaneously uh, for students of different ability levels. Um, not only had we special needs to high ability in terms of ability, uh, in terms of the ability, but we also expand a socio-economic group, and, th and this is important for us too in terms of motivation because there are differences. Um, all students have access to high-speed broadband uh, within their schools. So there was a <coughs> excuse me. There was a pre-trial test. Teachers selected an algebra topic and they tested it conventionally or taught it conventionally and then students were given the pretest. The trial proper then consisted of teachers set problems based on the topics they taught, and then they got them to use MyPace as a resource. And um, they instructed students then to, students went out, I think it was for a number of periods, they went to the computer room and they used MyPace 
to, uh, to solve those particular problems. Then post-trial, this is important to determine if there was any uplift in performance. They set another test, similar um, in, in terms of coverage, but different in terms of, of questions. So, and there was also an online questionnaire, and this is important to determine attitudes to the system and usage of the system. So if we look at how successful it was, we look at the industry challenges, leverage open content sources, identify gaps in industry generated content, reuse existing content. My case identified the top 20 informal learning resources that were competing um, with the publisher content. Um, they identify the format of the top 20 learning resources. And this is important for the publishers because they can get a handle on um, what learning strategies are actually working and what they, what they could incorporate into their products. It enabled the comparison of open content to publisher generated content in terms of attitudes and usage and enabled the reuse of the publisher generated content. So if we take the top 20 open content resources, we can see here we have the Khan Academy, Cool Math, BBC uh, Bite Size. So we've identified these were the sites that the students were looking at. They had the option of going into publisher content, but they were, they were combining the publisher content with these. So um, access to those, and I'll, I'll show you later, um, in terms of the BBC uh, bite size ones, proved very, very valuable in terms of uplift in performance. But again, the Khan Academy, Cool Math, a variety of, of ones coming up there. If we look at the format of these, we can see that 24% um, of the content resources were educational games, uh, educational video games. 8% uh, was educational video, 24% um, activity. And by activity, we mean an interactive piece of content, a test, an experiment, um, and finally, instructional, 44%. What do we mean by instructional in, in this context? Well, actually, it was very flat pieces of content. Uh, they weren't interactive, they weren't video, they weren't games, but the students were going, they may have been um, short lessons, they may have been explanations, they may have been examples, but students were going in and, and they were looking at them. Okay, so if we look at the industry challenges to raise all boats by helping average, fast and struggling learners, uh, we found that my case engaged across the ability spectrum and enabled students to find content that helped them with their algebra. So early indications also suggest that using my codes can improve student performance. So in terms of raising all boats, and I apologize, it's, it's not, it may not be very clear to the people at the back, we compared feedback from the high ability class to a special needs class. We asked the question, um, did you like using my codes? Now, we had expected a much greater difference. We have, um, I think it was 76% and 52%. We had expected a much greater difference in terms of yes answers. And the reason was because the content we populated it with, the formal content, was designed for a K-12 audience. In the States, we're further ahead in algebra at age, uh, age 11 to 13 than we are here in Ireland. Um, so we were surprised by that, but we thought perhaps they're looking at more informal content than formal content, and, they, and that might be the reason. When we asked, did the information help you with your algebra, here we were really surprised. We had felt that it would possibly help the high ability class more than the special needs class, but the special needs class were obviously finding resources and probably informal resources that were helping them with their algebra. Again, we need to do more research on this. We need larger sample sizes, but er, it, it, it's very interesting from a research perspective. Now, there were greater differences when you asked, did you find what you were looking for most of the time? 33% um, of the special needs class indicated no. So the, we, we thought about this carefully. It could be that the high ability class are more proficient searchers so they know exactly, in terms of search terms and so on, what to look for. The others had to hunt around possibly a bit more. But again, we're going to have to look at the data 
and we're going to have to go into it in much more detail to try and figure out um, what's going on there. So in, two, in, in terms of improving performance, this is an example. This is one class here where the teacher did a pretest. So he taught a topic conventionally, he did a pretest, and then he set problems on that topic. He got his students to use my case to um, solve those problems, and then he gave them a post-test. Now, the important thing is there was no learning intervention in between the pretest and the no conventional learning intervention. The only exposure they had was to my case. And the average uplift here was a 14% uplift. Even more interesting than the 14% uplift, and again, we, more research needs to go on here, is that the teacher was able to pinpoint exactly how the uplift had taken place with some students. He said they were going out, they were finding alternative methods of carrying out or, or, or of um, completing the, the math problems. So here, he, he gave the example, in terms of multiplying out brackets, he had taught them a particular way. But the students had found an alternative method called the box method on BBC Byteform. Some of them latched onto it and started to use it to solve problems. So the fact that he could pinpoint and say, yes, they're using this and they found it here, for us was evidence that um, they were going out, they were, finding, they were finding open content that actually explained <coughs> or presented them with an, an alternative method of working something out. And this for us is interesting and exciting, the fact that he could pinpoint it for us. Okay, um, I know I don't have much time, so I'm going to quickly fly through. So this is the higher education demonstrator. Um, our industry partner here were Elevation Solutions. They presented us with the challenges in this sector. The challenges here were to <coughs> push out the boundary of how instructors and learners can be supported by the NDLR, the National Repository of Digital Learning Resources. So essentially what you have here is lecturers upload their teaching resources to the repository. So there's a vast repository of teaching resources. The industry partner wanted, or wanted it also to be available to students so that students could go on and find material that was um, tailored to their individual learning needs. The other issue with it was that it was difficult to search. So it, it was run on a keyword search and it didn't always pull out the most relevant material. So they wanted us to um, come up with a new search uh, for it, uh, uh, and they also wanted us to come up with, uh, to enable students to find content that was personalised to the learning need. The use case here is a student, an engineering student, and also a lecturer. The lecturer is contributor and consumer of NDLR resources, and he also makes those uh, resources available to students through Moodle. Um, the learning strategy here that we wanted to promote because it's, it's, um, it's currently being pushed to third level is problem-based discovery learning. So the learning model on which, all, on which the use case uh, operates or works is problem-based discovery learning. So the technology solution in this case was an LMS help block. It's embedded in Moodle um, in this case, but it's uh, LMS agnostic. It can sit in, in any LMS. So the, the key here is that the students would type in metals. So if they have a learning need, they type in metals. So what happens here is um, they are f the semantic search kicks in. The semantic search goes off, presents them with a list of, um, uh, of concepts related to metals. They have to indicate their confidence with the, in, in each of those concepts. Now, this drives personalization. The key here is that this is explicit personalization as opposed to the implicit personalization that happened in the corporate use case. So we wanted to explore what would happen with 
explicit personalization where the user has to think about how much they know about each concept. So the student indicates their confidence level with each concept. And at this point, then, and that drives personalization. So at this point, then, the semantic search retrieves the relevant resources. Again, they're all tagged. And the, um, the composition component, the composer, once again, composes this into a learning method grade. It's a different learning method grade to that that we created with the, with the courses we've shaped. So here's the learning method grade here. So there are three different aspects to it, an advanced organizer, um, an introduction, and a lesson proper. So the user is free to select which or all of those resources. They're increasing in detail and complexity as they go down, but it's, that's the end user to decide the level of detail that they actually need. So they can open any of those resources. When they open it then, a box pulls, uh, uh, comes up, did you find method overview helpful, if that's what they went into. So they have to vote on that. They have to indicate whether or not it is useful for them. Um, so, what, so your social search then is leveraging the feedback for future searches. So again, in this use case, we have the personalization going on, we have the semantic search going on, and we, we have the social search going on. So a combination um, of our technologies. So in this case, the objective was um, facilitate content discovery based on individual needs of learners. So we asked the learners, would you describe the resources provided by the help doc as being too difficult, difficult, just right for me, or uh, easy or too easy. And 58% said, just right for me. So the resources were tailored to their specific learning needs, indicating that the personalization um, was working as expected. So the objective, expedite content discovery from the MDLR repository. Was the combination of social and semantic search better than the existing keyword search? Again, we had to test this. So um, we compared the help block to the MDLR keyword-based search. Uh, so for eight queries, six of, uh, and we had the lecturer, it, it was a blind test. We had the lecturer look through the resources that were returned. We asked them which was the most relevant. And they indicated that the resources that were returned by the help block itself, the combination of social and semantic search. Um, so if we look at the industry challenges that were given to us, support instructors and learners by leveraging learning resources from digital repositories, facilitate content discovery based on individual needs of learners, reuse digital content in different contexts. So the summary of the trial results, the help block, which incorporates the social and semantic search, provided more relevant search results than the keyword-based search that's currently used by the MDLR. Um, students indicated that the help block presented them with content that was just right for me, tailored to their knowledge and ability level. And finally, students indicated, and this was interesting, they would prefer implicit rather than explicit personalization. So, they did not necessarily want to have to indicate their level of confidence within each concept. They wanted the system to infer it. That is why we, we, we thought in, in terms of this, we have one implicit, one explicit personalization to figure out which is the most appropriate. So indications are that it's the implicit. They want the system to figure out the level that they're actually at. And the feedback on this was, uh, from the students, good system, still in its early stages. From the lecturer, um, from them, it provide one environment with a, an array of resource types which were more directed to what was needed. It, 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 it's, it's a long, but it, it's complimentary. So, <laughs> but it's quite long. Um, so essentially, that's where we're at. And the key message here is same technology, different demonstrators. So we had a number of technologies available to us, social search, semantic search, personalization and composition, data analytics for informal learning and reflection technology. 
we combine them in different ways to address the, in the industry challenges in the corporate K-12 and higher ed sectors. All look very different, the same technologies, different combinations. And the key thing for industry is that they don't have to take all of them because the challenges that, they, that, that we're listed to may be too many. They may not have all of those challenges, but they may take one or, two, or, or one or two of the component technologies may be relevant to them in terms of their particular challenges. So I'm going to pass over to Paul uh, for the Q&A uh, on this. Okay, so I think we've established that this crew knows what they're doing, all right? Um, we don't give access to our customers to just anybody. And I can tell you that if you engage with this crowd and you do get them engaged with your customers, your customers will be impressed. And this crew will actually make you look smarter than you really are. 